Good morning, everyone. Welcome to a new week. Thank you all for joining us today at the 17th Annual Research Institute Symposium. My name is Dr. Virginia Wright, and I am the Interim Vice President of Research at Holland Bloorview Kids Rehabilitation Hospital. I am honored to welcome you to a day of celebrating research advances, innovation, discovery, and knowledge translation for healthier, more meaningful future for all kids and families. I would like to open today's symposium by inviting everyone to acknowledge this sacred land on which we're privileged to be a small part. We are coming together to create this shared experience and to ground ourselves on this land on which Holland Bloorview Kids Rehabilitation Hospital is situated. This land, which we call Mother Earth, our Earth Mother, is the territory of the Huron-Wendat First Nations, the Seneca, the Mississaugas of the Credit Nation, the Mississauga of Scugog Island First Nation, Haudenosaunee. The Truth and Reconciliation Report and Calls to Action recommend that all levels of government implement Indigenous rights in the original spirit of the treaties. Indigenous peoples and allies for reconciliation view the treaties as a sacred obligation that commits both parties to maintain respectful relationships and share the lands and resources equitably. For those of us who are settlers, we are committed to a path of truth and reconciliation that's based on partnership and respect for the many ways of learning, knowing, and being. As we reflect on this research symposium in which we're about to engage, we are committed to the importance of how research will evolve, connect, and support Indigenous communities, colleagues, families, and clients. Today, Toronto is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island. We are grateful, honoured, and humbled to have the opportunity to live and work in this city, on this territory we call Turtle Island. Chimigwich, merci, thank you. I'd like now to welcome Julia Hanigsberg, our President and CEO, to say a few words. Julia. Thank you so much, Virginia, for the warm welcome. And thank you for your leadership as Interim Vice President of Research at Holland Bloorview Kids Rehabilitation Hospital. We are so happy to be in your capable hands this fall. It's wonderful, uh, once again, to be part of the annual Bloorview Research Institute Symposium. As the CEO here at Holland Bloorview Kids Rehabilitation Hospital, which is Canada's largest children's rehabilitation hospital and a top 40 Canadian research hospital for the past 11 years, I'm incredibly proud of the Bloorview Research Institute. Since its inception back in 2004, the BRI, as we call it, has advanced leadership in client and family-centered research and innovation. Each year, the Research Institute pushes limits through groundbreaking innovation, scientific achievement, remarkable leadership and collaborative partnerships. Collaborative partnerships with clinicians across our hospital, across the province, through research networks, nationally and globally. We are also are growing. Our institute is in the final stages of completing the largest research expansion in our 124 year old history. We are very grateful for the $32 million in donor contributed funds that have made this possible under the incredible leadership of the Holland Bloorview Kids Rehabilitation Hospital Foundation. With the completion of our renovated space and the 11,000 square foot addition, the child friendly and fully accessible research MRI, these changes will accelerate scientific discovery and will unlock new possibilities for children and families. Our hospital is also in the early stages developing our new strategic plan. And that plan will chart a course to uh, continue to advance the way we provide care and services to children and families. And I know that the Research Institute will want to revisit its own priorities as we work to align our contributions going forward. Also exciting this year, starting in January, we'll be welcoming the new VP Research, Dr. Edward Hia and Ignastu, and we're very excited between our new strategy and Evdokia's leadership for all the things that the future holds. 
I want to wish you all a wonderful day of learning, of understanding new advancements in research, and of coming together to celebrate uh, the important impact that research in childhood disability makes on the lives of children and their families. Have an excellent day. Thank you, Julia, for those wonderful words to start our day off. This year's symposium theme is Rethinking Childhood Disability, Imagination, Innovation, and Inclusion. I believe the theme that is conveyed in these three words that begin with the letter I really sums up what BRI is about. Our scientists, researchers, and trainees are constantly thinking of new, innovative, and imaginative ways to create a world of possibilities that will include all children living with disabilities and their families, and enacting this every day through client and family-centered research. We couldn't do all of this research without the support, as Julia mentioned, from our committed and generous donors and the Holland Blurvie Kids Rehabilitation Hospital. I would also like this opportunity to thank SADA and the Ontario Brain Institute for sponsoring today's symposium. Their sponsorship has made it possible for our researchers and trainees to present the transformational studies that they're conducting in close partnership with our clients and families. And we'll have a chance later this morning to hear from SADA, one of our sponsors. First though, a few housekeeping notes and tips to help you, our audience, get the best virtual event experience today. Please take a moment to navigate through the platform to familiarize yourself with FeedLoop. You'll see the event agenda when you click on the sessions icon on the navigation menu that's on the left side of your screen. Simply click on any of the virtual spaces contained within this session section to join any of the panels and discussions through the day as they occur. There will also be announcements from our events team through the day about upcoming sessions, as well as polls that you can participate in. So keep an eye on the chat on the right side of your screen for these announcements as the day progresses. Today, as you can see from our event agenda, you will learn about discoveries and advances in childhood disability that will change the way we provide care and treatment for kids and families now and well into the future. You'll also hear about how we can reimagine what the future of childhood disability research can be like from the perspective of a current client, one of our healthcare professionals, and a childhood disability researcher. We're also very fortunate to have Dr. Jamie Borisoff join us to deliver our annual Mickey Milner International Professional Keynote this afternoon. And indeed at this point, I would like to send a very warm welcome to our distinguished guest, Dr. Mickey Milner, who has joined us again today as in previous years. Welcome, Dr. Milner. I wish everyone an inspiring day hearing about the advances in cutting edge research that is informed by our clients and families. Please share your insights with us and comments on Twitter via our hashtag GrowHBResearch and tag us on at HBKidsHospital. It is now my distinct pleasure to welcome Dr. Trevor Young, Dean at the University of Toronto's Temerty Faculty of Medicine to say a few words, Dr. Young. Thank you, Virginia, for that kind introduction. Thanks as well for your interim leadership of the Blurview Research Institute this fall, and for your great work over many years in our Department of Physical Therapy and Rehabilitation Sciences Institute at the Temerty Faculty of Medicine. Thank you all for attending the 17th annual BRI Symposium today. It's a great pleasure to join you. This symposium has grown by leaps and bounds over the last decade and a half much like the Institute itself. It's been exciting to watch that growth and to see the impact of BRI and the Kids Rehabilitation Hospital on childhood disability research, education and care. The Institute's influence has been nothing short of transformative in Toronto and Canada and increasingly globally. And for the University of Toronto, this has meant a stronger and more integrated relationship with the Institute, the hospital, and with our other teaching and community hospital partners. The learning opportunities for our graduate students and postdoctoral fellows also continue to grow in rehabilitation sciences, but also in engineering, intelligent systems design, knowledge translation, implementation, and more. 
This work spans new interventions for children and families, but also the human aspects of disability and care and developmental diversity in autism, concussion, cerebral palsy, and many other conditions. It's really an exciting uh, time for researchers and learners alike and for children and their families. As I look at the agenda today and think about the recent past of the symposium, as well as the hospital's growth and progress over the last century, I'm very hopeful for the future and what we can achieve together for pediatric disability and rehabilitation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Young, for such a warm and inspiring message. I'd like now to introduce my co-host for today's event, Jennifer Rose. Jennifer is a pharmaceutical industry professional with more than a decade of experience of diverse leadership and research experience, including benchside and clinical evidence generation and strategic scientific capabilities. She is no stranger to the research and academic fields, given her vast experience in medical affairs launch activities, knowledge translation, clinical trial development and management, as well as academic curriculum development. Jennifer has authored more than 30 peer-reviewed publications in various therapy areas of oncology, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, rheumatology, and pneumology. She has been volunteering as a family leader at Holland Bloorview since 2020 and is a member of our Research Family Engagement Committee in our Bloorview Research Institute. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Jennifer. Thank you so much, Virginia. It's really an honor to be here today and co-host with you. I'm very excited for uh, an action-packed day. The agenda looks fantastic. And uh, it's really my pleasure as a family leader volunteer to give back to Holland Bloorview in any way that I can. Uh, my daughter is a family client and uh, she has a level one cerebral palsy and we're in and out of Holland Bloorview all the time. Uh, and it's just my uh, my honor really and my privilege to be able to volunteer um, uh, where I can. And uh, so I'm looking forward to a great day. Thank you, Jen. It's wonderful to have you co-host today's event with me. It's been really fun to get to know you over the past days as we've been preparing for this together. It's now my great pleasure to introduce you to this morning's panel who will discuss how we can reimagine the future of childhood disability research. This 45 minute panel will be followed by a five minute break. Please then attend our exciting student quick hit research presentations that will start at 10.05 a.m. or thereabouts. Now, I would like to invite Dr. Kate Einerson, who is a Knowledge Translation Specialist at the, our Bloorview Research Institute, to introduce the panel. So, Kate, it's now over to you. Welcome. Hello. Thank you, Virginia, for that lovely introduction. As Dr. Wright just mentioned, the themes of this year's symposium are imagination, innovation, and inclusion. So to get the day started, I'm so pleased to welcome you to our panel discussion called Reimagining the Future of Childhood Disability Research. Uh, my name is Kate Enerson, and I'm a Knowledge Translation Specialist in the Bloorview Research Institute. One of my passions is integrated knowledge translation, and integrated KT is doing research with rather than for the people who can use it. So our panel discussion today is close to my heart. Uh, we're bringing together some lived experience speakers who are both current and former clients of Holland Bloorview and past and present Bloorview staff. This insightful and generous group of folks have diverse lived experience and expertise when it comes to childhood disability research. They're going to talk to us today about what they believe is most important for childhood disability research and what they'd like to see in the future. Uh, rather than introducing them to you, I'd like to let them introduce themselves. So first, perhaps, uh, Dolores, if we have you here, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, hello everyone. I'm Dolores Lamte, a postdoc at York University, working on intersectionality of uh, inter uh, race and then disability. I've been a past postdoc at BRI, and I also volunteer at the Holland Love You uh, Rocks music program. I'm happy to be here to share my lived experience and my professional experience as a researcher with you. Thank you. Thank you, Dolores. Uh, next, maybe Maria, would you like to introduce yourself? 
Hi there, my name is Maria Walker. I'm a registered practical nurse on, uh, on the brain injury rehab team here at Helen Glorview. I was also a former student on the complex continuing care unit uh, back in 2018. And I'm also a former client at Holland Glorview for the past 25 years. Thank you, Maria. And Zach, would you like to introduce yourself to the group? Sure. Hi, my name is Zach. I've been a client at Holland Glorview since I was about two. I've done a lot of amazing stuff for Holland Glorview. I went to school there in kindergarten on my physio and PT is there and it's just a really supportive environment and I'm really happy to be on this panel today. Thank you so much. So today we have a couple of questions that the panel is going to discuss amongst themselves. Um, Zach, you're welcome to leave your camera on. We chatted before today's panel and there were some really wonderful insights and discussions just already arising organically. So we'll take uh, about half an hour to discuss uh, some of the, the questions we've already considered. And then we'll open the floor for questions from the audience. So please, as you're listening, uh, feel free to type your questions into the Zoom chat box inside Feedloop. Uh, and we'll have a few minutes at the end to bring those to the panelists as well. So without further ado, let's, let's dive in. My first question for the three of you is, can you please tell us about a meaningful experience that you have had in the past uh, related to childhood disability research? Okay, so this is DeLorence Lamptey speaking. Hi, DeLorence. Yeah, so a meaningful experience for me is the opportunity to train as a scholar with disability and give back to my community through research that throws the spotlight on the issues confronting children and families and also uh, strategies for promoting uh, the, the well-being. Yeah, thank you. Hello guys, um, a meaningful experience for me. Um, I grew up coming to Holland Glorview and um, I participated I had um, a limb reconstruction surgery done, and um, I was a part of different uh, researches, such as the gate lab here at Holland Glorview. I relearned how to walk, and that really helped me to where I am today, working um, on the brain injury rehab team and sharing my stories. Um, all I can think of right now. Um, Feel free to jump back in if okay. you expand on that. Zach, we'll pass the ball to you. Oh, audio. Oh, sorry, that's my bad. Well, a meaningful experience with research for me is just, I mentioned how earlier how Home Glory is such a good supportive environment. And one of the really key things I have in research is making sure that research gets to the people who can use it. And that's what I've had here at Holland Warview. People like that I know every day here, they get me the research and show me what to do to help me where I am today. And that's supported by the research. So my meaningful experience is more just how everyone's helped me make sure the research gets around to the people who can help with it. Yeah. Sorry, my audio was cut off when I started talking. That's all right. And Delorence, I see you unmuted again. I know you talked about doing the research. Did you want to pick up on Zach's thread about having research be shared? Yeah. So uh, I was born in the uh, mid 80s. As a person with a disability, I have like hemiplegia that affects my uh, the right side of my body and living through to like this generation, like looking at how research has like uh, improved the lives, health and people with disabilities from the mid eighties till now, I could actually, I can actually appreciate because I lived in an era where there was little evidence and little research. And now I can appreciate that well, there has been very good research through technology, um, health-wise, 
even some of the barriers that I faced in the mid 80s, early 90s have been reduced drastically. And I'm very happy that through research, a lot of children don't have to face many of the barriers that are faced as a child, like as a child with disabilities when I was growing up in the mid 80s throughout the, like, the 90s. So I'm very grateful for uh, research. Yeah, thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Dolores. And I think that ties in really nicely, uh, Maria, to what you were saying about the ways that research informed both your care and now your professional life. Do you want to expand on that at all? Um, yeah, for sure. Um, it really impacted me in a way because um, I see clients and family every single day and um, I see how it like impacts them moving on to like from being in as an inpatient at Hall of Bloorview to transitioning to them to go back home. I see how it like impacts them and how we can as a nurse or as a healthcare professional to like include occupational therapists, physiotherapists to transition them back home and get them to participate in different uh, therapies. Um, for me going back um, as a client, I remember um, when I participated in the gate lab to learn how to walk again, to get um, to learn how to walk straight. I was also 10 years ago, um, a part of a new research with a um, Taylor spatial frame, which is an external fixator. And that uh, impacted me greatly because I had no idea what it was going to be like. I, um, sorry, one second. I had no idea what it was going to be like. I um, was kind of like sad about it. And so I kind of learned more about it as I had the brace on my leg. I um, talked to other kids and families who were going through the same thing. And as soon as I got the brace off my leg, I wanted to be an advocate for kids who went through similar things as me. And so I also worked on the specialized orthopedic unit and I helped kids also with Taylor spatial frames. Yeah, so uh, I feel like I've helped a lot of people. Excellent. Maria, I don't think you could have queued up the next question better. So I think I'm gonna jump to the second question on our list, uh, which is, can you talk a bit about a time where you might have seen childhood disability research make a difference? either in your personal life or your professional life, maybe in the workplace. So if you've already picked up a thread, feel free to expand or to tell us something about uh, a bit different. Well, yeah, childhood research definitely had a big effect because from when I was little, knowing that there was research there and there was facts there and there was actually a plan to go on and I wasn't just diving into the unknown. That was a big supporter for me for moving forward. And yeah, that's what I'm basically saying is that knowing that research is there can really help someone along. Right, it's, it's good to know. I like what you said about it's good to know that there are facts. <laughs> exactly, you're not just diving into this, there's a floor, there's people who research this, there's a whole realm of people who can help you and support you. Make sure you're not just diving into this unprepared. You actually, if you can get access to the research, you actually know what you're getting into. Okay, so the, the support that you want and that you need to know that you're not alone. Exactly. Yeah. So Lawrence, that makes me think of what you said about your own experiences in your own childhood. Do you want to pick up on Zach's thought? Yeah, so for me, like I've lived as a personal experience and from a professional experience too, I think I see research uh, make an impact through advocacy and influencing uh, policies, uh, developing programs and tools to promote the rights, well-being, of children and families, as well as develop uh, the potentials of like children and families. So for example, um, I know many 
research at Bloorview have highlighted barriers over the years that like children and families are facing, which um, which advocacy groups have taken on board to advocate for groups and telling government or like policymakers that like this is the evidence. And over time, I've seen that like policies have been like changed to kind of uh, support the growth of uh, children with disabilities. And I think that uh, the policy, uh, the advocacy groups uh, needed the uh, to be evidence informed. So they needed the evidence to actually prove that well, this is a situation that we need to solve, or this is something that we need that can improve uh, the lives of people with disabilities and also make the society more inclusive for everyone. So I think it's really fantastic to have uh, this evidence uh, in from through research like over the years. Thank you, Dolores. So I'm, I'm hearing you shift from not just supporting individual children and families, but using evidence to, to advocate for and to drive systems change to benefit yeah. everyone. Excellent. Thank you. Maria, I see you nodding. What are your thoughts? Uh, no, I agree with Dolores. De um, I think that we should um, include more like uh, people in different research and involve clients and families. Okay, so the second part of this question about how you've seen childhood disability research make a difference is, I wonder if anything leaps to mind for you that should be reimagined or that needs to be changed to help research have more of an impact going forward. Uh, for me, I think research has uh, improved a lot where researchers, researchers and clinicians have moved from the fact that they were like the experts many, many years ago to where they kind of promote inclusive like practice where you kind of work with like the community to be able to uh, address, like find what the problem is and then address the needs together. And I think that like, I would encourage that uh, researchers would be given like all the support that they need to continue on like in this like path as opposed to, well, we are the experts and then we tell you like what you do. And I'm really grateful that like, you've like blow you is leading the way to practice more inclusive like research right from designing research to implementing and then like uh, disseminating like research like to the clinician like you kind of involve uh, the, the, the families and children are like throughout and I'm grateful to be part of uh, this organization. Thank you, Delorence. Yeah, integrating the expertise of, of folks like yourselves is something that Bloorview is trying hard to do. And I think from a knowledge translation perspective, you know, Bloorview does in a lot of ways lead the field in this work, centering the voices of folks with these experiences. Would anyone else like to weigh in about something that should be reimagined? Well, not really reimagined, but this is just me speaking. I think when I went into survey a couple years ago, knowing that there are all those videos about what it would be like and how it would do, really, you know, it really got me prepared for what it would be. And the research showing what it can be like and what it can do and just being able to learn about this really enhances the field. And as you were saying, including clients and families, Dr. Noor, it's more like I really like to see that for me. And I feel like for me is beginning to reimagine not just research, but accept, ex very, very accessible research. Hall for you already does an awesome job, but I would very much like it. And Hall for you is already doing a great job with this that research can be inclusive to everyone. Mm. Uh, I agree with De Lawrence and uh, Zach. Uh, I think another thing that could help reimagine the future of disability is um, 
yes, as Zach was saying, um, videos were helping him prepare for surgery and like other big um, like researches he's a part of or like whether he's learning how to walk again. Um, I think it's also good to include people with like past experiences. So for example, like I said before myself, I was an advocate for people with external fixators. Um, I feel like we should have more people with those lived experiences to share stories, whether they include them in different hobbies, um, like different sports, like they can all get together and they could like talk about how this impacted me, how what I think you should possibly do or um, ways to cope with different um, procedures that might happen. Okay, so Maria, I'm hearing maybe sharing not just research evidence, but sharing mm -hmm. some of that lived expertise. Yeah. That yeah. Thank sure. you. Like the live, uh, past experiences and just like kind of forming like a group or as I said, any sort of hobby that someone's interested in at Holland Group. Okay, broader supports then. Dolores, mm -hmm. I see you're unmuted. Yeah, I think that we we could also kind of encourage uh, young people, like with disabilities, to also get like in, like build their interest in pursuing academia and pursuing research, because mm -hmm. I imagine that like they have very good experience, like we all have very good experiences with like uh, like in the hospital, and they would want to become like a social worker or an occupational therapy because we have like that kind of good experience, and I think that. Uh, given the experience, like experience that like Love You gives like children and families, it would be good if we can support like the children right from a young age to pursue um, a, a, a career in academia and like become a scientist, which I think would be awesome for them to also kind of uh, prepare the way for the future generations to kind of move the uh, center like along nicely in the future. Right. Dolores, that's a fantastic point that changing research doesn't just mean participating in research or being part of a team, but it could mean being a researcher as well and, and shift it. With, what did you say? Shifting the center. I, I like that phrase. So you've, again, done a wonderful job bringing me to the third question in our discussion today. Um, we're sort of jumping off from where we are now. When you imagine the future of childhood disability research and perhaps of the Bloorview Research Institute, what's the most important change you would like to see? So, sorry, my audio is cutting out a bit. I didn't catch that question. Ah. When you imagine the future of childhood disability research moving forward, when you think about the future of the Bloorview Research Institute, what's the most important change that you would like to see? I feel like Lawrence did a really good job when he said this, shifting the center and making sure that it's more about the people going through and there are more supports for them. And that's one of the changes, like just add more of that and just more support. So it's not a thing. I've been saying the same thing over and over again. Sorry, I sound like a broken record, but it's that's not okay. a thing that you dive in without knowing what you're doing, but it's a thing that you can be prepared for. Okay, so moving the center to better accommodate for the needs and the interests of people with disabilities. Exactly. Or the people like me are actually supporting it or just making sure the center is focused where it can help people, Ooh. multiple people, not just one group. Okay, so making an impact, really making a difference and helping people. Thank you, Zach. Does anyone want to pick up that thread? What's what's an important change you would like to see, Maria or Dolores? I think one 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 important change would be making like the research uh, accessible 
to everyone uh, wherever they are in the world without having to have like go through the barriers of like paying for public like peer review or even kind of understanding because I realized that uh, as researchers we are trained to write in a way that act like to talk to fellow academics so we write in like in a in a, in a, in a an article in a journal to be published that like other academics would be able to understand but we like a parent or somebody else like me, who haven't been trained as an academic may be kind of difficult to understand. And I think that the, we need to be able to kind of find a way of bridging the gap where, I mean, if I write in a way that parents could understand, journals may not publish. And if I also write in a way that like journals would understand, it's going to like create barriers for a lot of people who need the knowledge to be able to use it. So I think that if we have a way of uh, making the knowledge that we produce uh, accessible to all without not having to kind of write a journal article and then produce another paper for like government or like another institution, I think that if you are, if you are able to kind of find a way of writing in a way that everybody Will understand regardless of whether you are like uh, like a professor or like you are just a parent. Mm -hmm. That would like that would help. So, Delorence, I'm really hearing a thread of conflicting incentives and conflicting audiences. You know, you write academic articles for scholarly audiences that live behind a paywall or perhaps are jargon dense or or both. Um, and then you have to do other work that may or may not be acknowledged or credited the same way to get that information to parents or clients or policymakers. So there's time and effort there in the in meeting those those different types of needs. Is that what you're getting at? Yes. Thanks. Um. Hi guys, um, I think what's important also is to ask um, people with these experience what they would like, what would help them um, kind of do better in the future, exceed in the future to get to where they are. So I think researchers should, um, I mean, it might be hard to ask them all individually, but see what can help them um, get to where they want to be okay so not just you know having a scholarly person or an mm -hmm. academic make decisions but check with people about what they want or what they need or what is of interest yeah. explore their needs uh see what makes them comfortable what uh works and what doesn't work for them uh, just sit down and get get to really know the person spend the day with them see see what life is like for them and how you can kind of alter and help them out so Amazing. And Maria, you're kind of bringing us back to the whole point of today's conversation, which is that we have, you know, I think 200 people in the room right now listening to this, wanting to, to hear and to learn these insights mm -hmm. from each of you coming from different perspectives. Um, so we're getting close to the end of our list of questions for conversation. I think I'll just prompt the audience because I know some folks have joined us uh, since we got started. We're gonna have, I hope, about 15 minutes for the group to take questions from the audience. So please, if there's something you'd like the panelists to discuss, put together a question into the Zoom chat box inside FeedLoop, um, and we'll have some time to cover that. So while people are composing their questions, I just want to uh, give the three of you a chance for a final take home message. Is there, since we have uh, researchers, scholars, family members, also trainees who are the future of research, you know, in our digital room today, is there one thing that you want researchers to know? Is there something you'd like to end on as a take home message before we open the floor? Yeah, for me, I think that we can actually enhance the capacity of research to engage in other evidence informed works like policy development or manual train like training manuals or curriculum development that uh, may not necessarily be published in like academic uh, journals or scientific conferences but they are very important to bridge the gap between research and and practice and i think we we should be able to encourage researchers to be able to like do that 
And Delorens, you said extra training. I know this is something you're passionate about. What kind of skill building do you think would be important for scholars and scientists? Yeah, so for example, like uh, providing like the funding and then the like the resources to be able to work with uh, with policy makers uh, to be able to uh, develop policy. So when we do research, we have uh, recommendations, but most of the time we would be able to uh, pursue uh, recommendations for future research. But in terms of like policy development, I feel that we uh, we need kind of training in a in a way where we'll be able to talk in a language that like uh, uh, the policy maker like me understand to be able to work with them, or to be able to kind of work with organizations to kind of find out that like this is the problem that we are facing, we've researched and this is the solutions that we could actually come up like together. Yeah, so working with people other than training in terms of working with people other than students and other professionals, like, uh, and students and then other academic, but working with the end user to be able to uh, translate the knowledge really well. Okay, so sort of an expansion on what Maria was saying about asking people about their experiences, maybe also plugging into those other audiences, like, like um, practitioners or policy makers, managers, you know, systems level decision makers, right? And Maria or Zach, is there one thing you want researchers to know? Just what, what I've been saying, like a bo broken record the entire time. Try and make research more accessible. Homeboy okay. is doing an awesome job. It's definitely leading the field in that point. But I would love to see research become way more accessible to all. So everyone who needs it can be support and not have to dive into the unknown without being prepared for what might, for what obstacles they might face. And Zach, are you thinking of making participating in research accessible or like Deloren said, learning to be a researcher? All, more like all aspects of research. I want the whole encompass of research to be accessible for anyone needing it, not just participating, though that would be awesome, getting more clients and more people in general to participate in the research, but also access to research. When I say make research more inclusive, I mean the whole area of research. I'm not right. trying to narrow down on one point. Amazing. So Zach, you mean everything. You're, you're going big here. You're not yeah. talking about any part of it. Go big or go home. Go big or go home. All right. Maria, I see you nodding. Something to add to Zach's call to action. Yeah, so uh, again, including everybody in research, clinicians, uh, any, anyone like at Hall and Blur Review, so, um, and maybe having more um, like sort of, I guess, big events sort of like this that will help uh, different families and clients and uh, other healthcare professionals learn about the individual. So just having a um, big event about like a certain diagnosis and how to help out um, people with like say cerebral palsy, um, learn how to sort of make their life a lot easier. So yeah, I expand it to the whole hospital and make it more accessible. And Holland Blur is already doing a great job at that. Okay. So keep doing what we're doing, but do it even better. So I'm hearing this idea of like, get it out in front of people, not just raise awareness, but help folks find what they need, right? Yeah. Uh, so get it in front of them in a format they could use in a place they can find it, you know, the right information at the right time. Yeah. Okay. I'm seeing a question come in from our co-host, Jennifer. Um, who is such, I'm hearing a theme of getting research out there more, things like plain language summaries for families. Does anyone on the panel have suggestions for the researchers here today on how to reach more families with that published research? 
Delorence, maybe I'll bring that to you first because you talked about published research sometimes not being what families need. What are your thoughts about getting that information to families? Yeah, so I like I like ideally I would prefer that like research would be public open access. Okay. And then uh, yeah. for those here who don't know, open access research tends to be work that is not put behind a paywall or protected. So it's a different way of organizing scholarly information. <laughs> Sorry, Delorence, continue. Yeah, so so the information is like free, to, like to everybody. And then we could also provide like a kind of a list summary or kind of write in a language where everybody would like understand. So even if the paper is very free and then I get it, I should be able to read and then uh, understand what the paper like is like is, is, is like is saying as opposed to uh, having difficulties to uh, understand and I need a third party to explain it to me. Mm -hmm. And I, I feel that like uh, families should be encouraged to also uh, feel free to contact like the researchers as opposed to like the academics. So I see a paper that I like and I can like contact the research, like the papers or like the author to kind of discuss more of like their findings and what I can do like, like with it. So I think that it's something that could help. Right. That's a great point, Delorence. A lot of people don't know that if they come across an article on Google or elsewhere, that they can always contact the researcher who's listed on the paper if they'd like more information, or maybe they can't access the paper behind a paywall. Most scholars will be very excited to share that work with anyone who reaches out, uh, but people don't always know that's okay. Uh, Zach or Maria, do you want to pick up on Jennifer's question uh, about suggestions to researchers on how they could reach families with their work? Um, well, I work in the brain injury unit, so maybe um, coming up with like a survey that could be distributed to like the inpatient and outpatient units here at Holland Bloorview, um, maybe asking questions like, uh, how do you feel about uh, your child's disability? Are you knowledgeable about it? Is there anything we could do to help? Can be completely anonymous. Um, and they could just fill out a survey so that way researchers know kind of like what to explore and what to do. Okay, getting a sense of needs and yeah. wants. Yeah, so really just going into the inpatient unit and again, keeping patient confidentiality, just keeping it anonymous and seeing how they could help and they could go around door to door and ask, just ask questions. How's, I, how's everyone doing today? How are we feeling? Yeah. Right, checking in on the ground. Checking in. Zach? Yeah, and something I'm also kind of seeing is there, there might be a lot of online platforms for research, but the thing is, we got to get those online platforms out there and those sites for research out there so people know where to look. Because a lot of people looking for research don't know about all these wonderful places where all the research is. So really promoting where to find that research and not only that, but promoting that anyone can find it. Like it's not just for scholars. You can like come in and see that research and be more supportive and confident about it. You know, even make a website like around Home Review where all that research can be shared in a format where everyone can understand, and then getting that out there and making sure people know where to look. Because a lot of people looking for research, they don't know where to start looking. And where I started looking were the people and the staff at Home and Plurview, who did a wonderful job of getting that research around. So as long as we know where to look, I'm, I think we'll be fine to lot of it. But I think the main thing I'm trying to say is we're helping people know where to look. Right, especially if that information already exists, just helping people find it is sometimes the missing link. Exactly, that was the big missing link for me. So I'm thinking it might be the missing link for others. 
Okay, I wonder if you're right, Seth. The discussion we're having now is making me think, for example, of the research unlocked, which are a series of research summaries for families that I know have been designed within BRI and with evidence to care. And those are exactly the types of summaries, um, Dolores, that you were describing and that uh, Jennifer has said about plain language, but I think lots of folks don't know those exist. They're great though, so feel free to check them out. Um, We've had another question come in. So Jessica says, other than holding events like this and involving clients and families in research, do you think there are ways for research to be brought to clients, not only open access for clients to use, but do you think there are ways for researchers to be more engaged in the healthcare process directly? And what would that look like? So Maria, you said, for example, researchers sort of coming to the bedside almost, meeting people literally where they are. Yeah, or participating in their uh, therapies, their PTO, uh, physiotherapy, occupational therapy, and speech therapy sessions, um, and seeing how these researchers could um, help the spe uh, speech language pathologists or physiotherapists kind of like work with these kids. The, get to the goal they want to be at. Anybody else? <laughs> yeah, I, I think that it's also kind of very important, which Ola Blovi does really well, mm -hmm. uh, to make clients like within the hospital, like feel that like you don't necessarily, I don't necessarily need you for your, like for just data, but like you are just part of the, uh, you are not just like a participant that I need information to go and do my research, but like you are, like I see you as a, like an equal, like colleague, like cool researcher that like we are producing the, the knowledge together. And I think that for a lot of people who may pass through the hospital, like they are like looking for solutions for like either their health or like or something. And I feel that we need to be able to have the program to let them feel that yes, like even though you are a, a client in uh, in the hospital, when it comes to research, we don't see you as a client. We see you as like a, like a cool partner that we could produce the knowledge together, as opposed to you seeing yourself as working like with like a client working with a clinician. But for researchers, I'm not a clinician, but I'm happy to work with you to produce uh, like equal like like equally to produce knowledge that would benefit like you and everybody else and including myself yeah okay so delorence i'm hearing both equality and equity in that that this is true partnership it's not just participating in research because a researcher needs data but having a, a seat at the table to co-produce alongside yeah. the people with the research agenda yeah yeah, and I think that the hospital would have to have a way of letting the uh, the the participants know, be aware that well, in this case, we are not seeing you as a client, and don't see yourself as a client. Just see yourself as a co-producer of like of this knowledge, as opposed to well, uh, you've come to the hospital and a clinician is going to diagnose you and tell you A, B, C, and D. But in this case, I'm not telling you, but we we are kind of producing the knowledge together. Excellent. Thank you. That, that true partnership. Zach, anything to add? No, just the fact that I'm more like what Marie was saying about getting researchers to come to the hospital and talk about this with them, come to where people who, who need these research are. Because I just think that's a really great idea to get them to come because a lot of people here don't know about the awesome research site you told me about and they're all situated right here so having researchers come around and meet them here would be amazing that's a really awesome idea thanks zach and i, I hear us almost circling around to last year's symposium theme about breaking down barriers <laughs> Um, so I'm mindful of the time. We've got five more minutes. Jennifer has sent sort of a last question, and I'd love if you'd think about this as we wrap up for the day. She says, you know, you had a great point that we've talked about earlier about the importance of shifting the research 
so that the center of support is where it needs to be, so that the research is centered on the needs of clients and families. Does the panel have any suggestions about how research can be designed with this fundamental shift in mind? Zach? Sorry, I feel like I'm hugging the mic, but I just, I just want to say that my idea would mainly be not only getting it to the clients and to support them to shift the center of research to them, but also kind of, uh, I've got the idea, I just don't know how to say it, to, you want to shift the center of research to the client, so make the research make them be able to participate and get to the research not only that but also to kind of like be able to understand what's going on around them and i really like what dr lancy said about making it in plain text and i feel like shifting it so it's not so much a sciencey technological thing but making it a way that you can understand would be a great way to shift it to a client. Okay, so client-centeredness starts right with how you communicate and what you communicate. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Dolores? Yeah, and also think that like we, we like for a lot of researchers, we do a very good job uh, when we are looking for like uh, people participants or people to coll collaborate with, we will do everything to be able to communicate the research like in like, like to kind of understand for them to understand what we are doing but then throughout the research when we we get them and then we on board throughout the research process like through publishing like it's kind of very difficult to kind of apply that the same aggressiveness from the beginning at like in the middle and at the, at the end and i think that we we should be able to like uh, go through like disseminate the knowledge or like involve participants throughout the research, just like we, when we are like seeking the knowledge, like when we are seeking them to participate, we write in a way that they understand. Right. So I'm hearing you sort of pulling people into the entire research process, not just in the data collection phase, but from start to finish. Yeah. And I think that aligns with a comment that just came in from Lorraine about, it's not so much about getting research to families, it's about making the research relevant to their circumstances and allowing them to see real world impact. And I would argue that involving families in the research process is one way of ensuring that research is relevant to the circumstances of clients and families. Because Maria, you already pointed out that if you ask people, they'll tell you what's most important to them, right? And they can do that from day zero. So Maria, anything else? We have one minute left before we wrap up. <laughs> Any comments about centering the needs of clients and families? Um, again, as I said before, involving everybody in research and care. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. So with our with our last minute, I'll just say thanks to the three of you for being so generous today with your time and with your expertise. It's so exciting for me as a person who really cares about these types of partnerships and this research co-production to hear other people talk about the importance of bringing everyone to the table together to pursuing equitable and meaningful research to sharing it in a way that makes these impacts in the world. Uh, I think everyone on the call today is passionate about having an impact with the work that we do. So thank you ever so much for your time and your enthusiasm. This has been a fantastic way to kick off today's symposium. So thank you kindly. I think uh, Virginia, Perhaps we're back over to you. Thank you all so much, Maria, DeLawrence, and Zach, for your incredible depth of sharing with us. And to you, Kate, for your fabulous mediation of this panel, moderation of this panel as well. Um, I think there are just so many ideas. Kate, you've summed them up all really well. I was taking frantic notes here, actually, because so much. I've actually got a couple of pages of notes from this. And I think just to quote Zach and Maria on the go big or go home theme, include everyone in the research, try and make all aspects of research, the whole process 
more accessible. And while, as you said, Holland Blurview is doing an awesome job, we can go even further to get the research out in front of people, the right info at the right time, and for people knowing where to find it. So I think fabulous tips for all of us in the research enterprise here. Um, and we really look forward to maintaining contact with the three of you as we move ahead to the future of making research more visible, more relevant, more open, as, as Delorence stressed, I think, so brilliantly on the ways of making it open to all um, as this true partnership. So thank you all so very much for such a meaningful session um, that we will remember and we will work from as well into the future. Thank you. We will now take a five minute break and then at 10.05, you can join us using this very same link for the ever popular quick hits portion of our event when we return. All right, we'll see you then. Thanks. <laughs>